Hi, everybody. It's Michelangelo Caruso. Welcome back to another podcast episode, Talk to Me. I have a most fascinating guest today. I am, uh, I am extra pleased to introduce you to an old teacher from my high school. Uh, uh, I should say a teacher from my old high school. This is John Wilkovitz, everybody. Hi, John. Hey, Mike. Thanks a lot for having me here. It's especially pleasing because I've known you for so long. Uh, kids I taught through the years in Trenton uh, have turned out so well, and you certainly lead the pack. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure. I don't know that I actually had the, the honor of being in your classroom, but people talked about you like you were Yoda. <laughs> he was bald too, right? Well, I don't know if you were even bald back then, but, but yeah. there's something about teaching that is a rare stripe when teachers can connect over and over and over again. I think everybody gets to some students. But when you get to the majority of the students and turn them on to topics like you did, like history, I think that's a magical thing because they usually now turn down to history for the rest of their lives. Is that your experience? It has been that experience quite uh, often. Uh, students have told me in various formats, uh, Facebook or calls or just seeing me somewhere, that, hey, you were the reason I became a teacher, or because of you, I enjoy history, that kind of a thing. Yeah. I think a, a teacher, to do that, they have to, first of all, obviously know the subject matter, but they have to like the age group they're teaching. Yeah. You don't have to be friends with them, but you have to enjoy that age group. And so I think that uh, leads to the results I've had. So I've been blessed with, with two wonderful careers teaching kids like you and now writing history for a World War II market. Yeah, and I want to learn more about this World War II. Um, uh, it strikes me that all of us that are teaching, and I do my share of teaching too, it's a different format with presentation skills and sales and leadership and that sort of thing. But I'm reminded of John Locke back in the day. He had this thing called tabula rasa. He said that everybody that we teach, John, is like a blank slate. And a good, responsible teacher is writing on that slate and helping them learn a lesson, appreciate things. And you've certainly done that with, with history. Tell us about how you moved from teaching high school history to becoming one of our preeminent World War II authors in the United States. Well, uh, Mike, I'd always wanted, I had this little secret desire to write uh, history, but for years I sort of pushed it back. I was teaching and I was thoroughly enjoying that. And I had this little nag of a doubt, oh, you're not going to be good enough, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I was real big in, in my classrooms with uh, talking to the kids about follow your dreams. Don't let anyone tell you you can't be something. And one day I was telling them that and I thought, all right, Wokovitz, you're saying something to them and you're not doing it yourself. And so that was the impetus. And so I started looking into it. The first uh, article I wrote was for a local newspaper, the Wyandotte News Herald. Oh, sure. And uh, yeah, and then I moved on to magazines and then to books. It just took a few years, obviously. I, I compressed 15 to 20 years here in, in as many seconds. Yeah. Uh, you just kept working at it and working at it and um, things started to happen. And, and now they're happening quite nicely. So for the people listening who are entering that change of life called retirement and, and, and feeling that they have much more to give, I always tell people that they have skills they haven't tapped when they retire. It's not, you know, it doesn't even have to be the end of activity. Not uh, at all. Did you retire with the express purpose of becoming an author or were you kind of just winging it and keeping your fingers crossed? Did you have a plan or did you amble into it? Uh, I had a plan. Uh, first, I started writing midway through my teaching career. So the last 15 years or so that I taught, I also wrote or was trying to get the writing career going. You know, I wrote those uh, newspaper articles, etc. cetera. Um, but I had a plan. I started out with this grandiose 10-year plan, you know, and, and then you, you, each year I would fine-tune it for that precise year. But I did have an ultimate goal. You know, wouldn't it be great to just get one book written somewhere? And now how am I going to do that? And I would each year write down the steps that I would take that year to achieve that goal. 
And it ended up happening, maybe not at the speed I wanted. You know, it took a little bit longer, but I was having fun all through the time and, and I could see progress being made. And I just thought, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I love it. Do you still have the original 10 year plan? It's around here somewhere. It was, uh, I haven't looked at it in a long time, um, but yeah, still have them. It was basically 10 years from now to have a book published. In the meantime, all right, let's get some news, more newspaper articles published and use those to lead to magazine articles, national magazine articles. And then maybe I could lead, use those and somehow get my first book kind of a thing. Yeah. Right, right. Do you, uh, do you have a 10-year plan now, John? I do not. Uh, keep breathing. Maybe it's my <laughs> <ten -year plan. laughs> Because now I'm, I'm taking it. All right, I'm writing another book, and I'm going to have fun with that, and we'll see how it goes. But at age 74, you, you start slowing down a little bit. Um, I, I was out golfing yesterday, so it's not like I've, uh, you know, cashed in my chips by any means. And I'll keep doing other things, but a 10-year plan, probably not. I, I stopped that a few years ago once. Okay, I know I can get a book published now. I have my agent. Uh, when I want to write something, we'll just get the proposal in. I'm all set. So what more do I need? I hear so, you. I hear you. Um, so tell us now, uh, take us into the second, what we call the second stage of life, right? The, how many books have you written? Twelve. Uh, the one that's coming out in next month will be my twelfth for the major market. I also did, before that, I did a series of 50-some books for the teenage market. You know, how many? They, how many? 50, 55. They're small, you know, maybe 25,000 words, which is about a quarter of the size of my current books. They didn't require primary research. Just read other articles, other books on uh, Jack Nicholas or Japanese internment camps or whatever the topic for the book was. And it was just fun, made a little bit of extra money to keep me going while I tried to land the first book with the major mainstream market, you know, for which you need an agent. And uh, then I, I, I did eventually get into that. And those are the 12 books that I've written for the mainstream market. Yeah. Fabulous. I think people would be interested that it's a, it is a kind of a stepping stone process in most cases. I always tell people when you're getting ready to write a book, consider writing a booklet. Yeah. Get something, get an early, early victory so that you, you have some proof of concept and that you understand what's happening. It can take a long time to birth a book, yeah? It, it did for me the way I decided to do it, and it worked. It took a while, you know, and, and I thought, all right, I, when I first started, I had, I had no outlets other than Wyandotte News Herald came along. And um, uh, so I kept a diary of sorts and would record my thoughts. And I thought, all right, just practice writing. Because when I was a student at Notre Dame, a student asked our literature professor, how do you become a writer? And he responded, you sit down at a desk with your typewriter. You know, this was in the days before computers. And he said, then 10 years later, maybe you're a writer. His yeah. point was practice, 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 just like yeah. Thing else. So the journal or diary was meant for practice. Then the articles took over and, and, and that was my practice. But you just keep writing. You keep trying. In the early years, I took anything, no pay, didn't matter. You know, I'd, I'd review a book. I'd give a talk. I just wanted to get my name out. And, and that's what you have to do. So you, it worked for me. You inadvertently reminded me just now that I took a typing class either at Trenton High School or probably maybe junior high the year before. F, 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 G, T, T, T. And I was thinking to myself, even, even with a seventh grade brain, I'm never going to need typing in my life. Right. This is before computers and laptops. And oh, my, my first articles I hand wrote. And wow. then I typed them out to send wow. them. Yeah, I just, I hand wrote, I didn't have a word processor or anything. Then I eventually, in the 19, early 90s or 1990s, uh, a, a Xerox memory writer, I think it was called, where you could actually save things to disks. And I thought, oh, this is golden. I love it. Well, now computers take care of all that stuff. Your stripe 
in history is a specific niche. It's not only World War II, it's the Pacific Theater. Do I have that right? You do. I was in, in the fourth grade, a student, when I read a book about the Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, a significant naval clash in World War II. Yeah. I was hooked on the Pacific. I, I also was intrigued by the contrast of all these island campaigns, brutal, bloody, you know, vicious battles fought on paradise, a lagoon, blue water, palm trees, that stuff. You know, you, you generally think vacation and fun and all, but you had all this carnage. And, and, and that sort of was an interesting contrast for me. That's an interesting uh, juxtaposition. And I had a similar one, not nearly to the depth that you've had in terms of interest, but remember um, the John F. Kennedy movie with Cliff Robertson, PT-109? Yeah, yeah. And the, this tiny little PT boat gets hit by a major ship. And uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, this is before Kennedy was president. They had the bail on the ship. There's a story about him putting the life vest strap in his mouth and towing one of the guys to the island. And that was the Pacific Theater, correct? Correct, that was. Yes, that was in the Solomon Islands. Uh, his PT boat was run over by a Japanese ship, and he certainly came through in a courageous manner to save the lives of uh, his shipmates there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've had 12 books, uh, John. Uh, and by the way, everybody, you can... You can see the books at johnwukovitz.com. That's J H, sorry, J O H N W U K O V I T S.com. They're also available uh, in online bookstores or in the bookstores themselves if you care to go visit. 12 books. Um, what's the best seller? What's the most popular? The one that sold the best is a book called One Square Mile of Hell. That came out in 2006. It's about the Battle of Tarawa, which occurred in November of 1943. The Marines landed on this small island. It was smaller than uh, Grozil, for those who don't know Grozil. You know, it was about two miles long and 800 yards wide at its widest. Mm -hmm. So they, they, it, for those who saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, the opening battle sequence at Utah Beach, uh, Omaha Beach, I mean, um, it was that for three days. It was constant combat, nonstop fighting. It was brutal. And um, I, we took the title from a Time Magazine article written by a correspondent who was there, and he said it was one square mile of hell. Um, that one has sold the most. Um, the Battle of Wake Island, the book right before that, is the second most as far as uh, sales. Now, the, the one that's currently, or in August, going to appear, maybe that will take over. You never know. It's the story of the last four men to die in World War II in a combat mission. Uh, they were pilots flying off the aircraft carrier Yorktown off the coast of Japan in the war's closing days. And these four men didn't really want to fly any more missions because the war was basically over. The atom bombs had been dropped, but they still kept getting their orders, go attack this factory, this anti-aircraft position, or whatever. And orders were orders. On the last day of the war, which they did not know when they took off, they took off for their targets over Tokyo. They arrived over their targets when they received a call back from the carrier, hey, War is over, ceasefire is announced, come back. They happily turned around, but were attacked by 20 Japanese fighters and shot down and killed. Oh. That's an amazing story. Amazing. What's, what's the name of that book? Dog Fight Over Tokyo. Okay. That's your 12th book? Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, a quick comment about the timing. Uh, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of Civil War study, and in the Civil War, that war was over weeks before people knew it was over. Yeah. Because there was no, I mean, e even newspaper delivery was not what it, what it is today. Sure. Uh, so we had that time lag in World War II as well. It was not as significant. It, it would be a, a, a radio signal relayed to the 
admirals in the Pacific. They got it to the carrier. The carrier got it right out to the pilots. But it, it just happened that as they were turning back, they were attacked by some Japanese pilots, in part who just were not going to surrender, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so technically, they took off during war, but were killed during peace. That's interesting. Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah, somebody some, to research this story. Somebody should have thought to send the message to the Japanese that the war was over. That might have been helpful. They did, yeah, <laughs> they, they knew. Uh, but a lot of people in Japan, the militarists especially, you know, we don't surrender. We're not going to give up. They, the group even tried to break in and seize the recording of Emperor Hirohito's talk announcing we're stopping the fighting. Oh, they wow. Succeed, but, but they just didn't want to give up. Yeah. And so, um, unfortunately, these four pilots, one of whom was from the Detroit area, another from Kokomo, Indiana, uh, they didn't make it back, and it really affected their families. This book, uh, going back to One Square Mile of Hell, what number book was that for you? That would have been the third. So this is fascinating to me. I, I love marketing. I love figuring out what becomes popular, when, and how. Why was your third book? which by the way, and you don't have to tell me the answer to this, may not be your best book. Um, Why is agreed, you know, it depends on the mood. <laughs> I, I think, you know, people have always asked, what's your favorite book? And I answer, well, I have three daughters. Who's my favorite daughter? I love them all the same, but maybe for different reasons. Yeah. Same with my books. You know, I try hard. I put the same amount of effort into every book. I'm often reminded of, a remark made by the filmmaker, uh, Martin Scorsese. Uh, someone asked him a similar question about his films, and he sure had a wonderful career. He said, you know, when I produce every movie, I think it's the best I've ever done. But then sometimes the audience comes in and says, no, we don't like it. <laughs> he says, I can't figure it out. And the same with books. I have no clue which one will be tops or not tops when you put it out. I just focus in the process of researching and writing with 100% effort to give the best I can do. When I hand it in, I go, all right, I'm done. Now it's up to the public to let me know if they like it or not. Yeah. For sure. Well, you've got a book, um, a book that is about to receive a major marketing boost, and it is the dream, I think, of so many authors that the book has been optioned for a Hollywood movie. I hope I'm not talking out of school to bring this up. Well, not at all. Yeah, very, I mean, a dream, it's it's hardly even that. I, I, you just don't even think of it. I know when I jog out at the high school track, I still do that. Um, sometimes your mind wanders and you go, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, and, and one of those, wouldn't it be cool if is a movie. Well, this yes. one um, is, is has been optioned by a group called the Hollywood Gang. They did seven and The Departed, uh, and uh, they have Mel Gibson as director and Mark Wahlberg starring in it. It's currently in pre-production. They're uh, working on the financing, and once that's settled, they'll set a, a film schedule. So for those of you listening, John Wolkowitz has written a book called... Hell from the Heavens is the name. It's the story of a destroyer in World War II in the Pacific, called the Laffey, L-A-F-F-E-Y. This destroyer was off the coast of Okinawa in April of 1945 when 22 kamikaze aircraft attacked it over a period of 80 minutes. They didn't all 22 come in at once. Uh, the ship fended them off. They were hit by six. They were hit by a few other bombs that these planes dropped. They were, you know, fires raging. Uh, but they successfully survived that attack. Successfully, they lost a third of the crew in the action. Mm -hmm. But it was just a, a real heroic defense of the ship. And the captain, Julian Becton, gave a great quote uh, that I put up there with all the great naval comments. Uh, when uh, an officer came and said, Captain, do you think we ought to abandon ship? Because the ship was uh, going down by the stern. He thought it didn't, but he thought so. And Beckton said, I'll never surrender or abandon ship as long as a gun will fire. And they stayed at it and, excuse me, and, and made it through. Did you say hell from the heavens? Hell from the heavens. Okay. So uh, it sounds like a fascinating story. I can't wait to read it. T 
tell, walk us through what happens in order for a book to be picked up by, by Hollywood, no less a, a major producer, uh, or I guess he's directing. Mel Gibson is directing. Correct. And Wahlberg is starring in it. Correct. And, and is it fair to say, is everything a lock? Because sometimes this stuff shifts a little bit. Yeah, it seems to be a lock. I mean, you, anything can come along and happen to knock it off the rails, obviously. Like the financing has taken a little longer than they thought because they're dealing with China. Well, you know, with the economic situation today. Uh, so it slowed things down, but it's still on the rails. Uh, they're, they're in pre-production. Uh, for things. He's chosen Australia where he wants to film this movie. Um, uh, and, and so unless something unforeseen happens, yeah, it's, it's in the books. Does it have a release date? No. Okay. No film scheduling. He was going to start earlier this year, but that's been pushed back because of this hassle over the financing. Okay. Uh, and then that's why they just have to get that straightened out. Can you tell us? I uh, wasn't worried about that, so I'll take his word for it. Can you walk us through uh, this process of getting an email or a phone call from Mel Gibson? How does this happen? How did you feel? I understand you had a chance to visit with him for dinner at his house. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Walk yeah. us through this. This is fun. People will enjoy hearing about this. It started in 2016 my agent received this email from a Hollywood producer, the Hollywood gang saying, Hey, we're interested in making a film. And that was the start of it. It took a couple years for it to get rolling for them to get a screenplay to get Mel Gibson to sign on and all of that. And it was after they finished the screenplay that um, Gibson called and uh, it said, I'd like to have you come out to, Flo to Florida, to California. To, he has a home in Malibu. We want to go over the screenplay with you. Uh, sorry, he called or emailed? No, he called. And this, yeah, the, uh, the, the producer gave me a heads up. He said, Mel Gibson wants to call you. Are you going to be there? I said, yeah, I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> you said, I'll try to be around? As as I could. Yeah, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so you're waiting by the phone. The phone rings. You pick it up, and it's Mel Gibson. Correct. Yeah, how, did, how did you feel? Well, first of all, it, it was really cool. I mean, just, gosh, I'm talking to Mel Gibson. Secondly, I thought, you know, he sounds just like he does in his movies, you know, the same way. And uh, then we, we he had a few questions on naval tactics, which I answered for him. And he was laughing, having fun with me. You know, it was, he made me very comfortable on the phone. Well, then he said, well, we'd like you to come out and uh, go over the screenplay. Now, that's unusual. Most times when you option a book to be turned into a film, the writer has nothing to do with it. Uh, the famous writer, Elmore Leonard, who was from our area, he, he yeah. wrote wonderful things. Many turned into movies. He always said, when Hollywood, I sign off on an option, I let go of the book because I know they don't want my input and I don't want to know what they're doing to it. <laughs> but Gibson wanted to talk but, to you. Yeah, he, he called me out, so uh, they flew me out to his home. I was there for four days, actually, uh, going over the screenplay with the writer and Gibson and the visual effects director, the storyboard editor, that kind of stuff, and Wilkowitz. You know? <laughs> you know, like, who doesn't fit in this picture? You know, which one of the, these that I named doesn't fit? And we so, just went over it, and my job was to let them know, okay, that that's a mistake. You can't have that or you shouldn't. Uh, yeah. Well, that's good for authenticity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, now, you, I, I pointed out a couple little things to them. Whether he changes it is up to him. I mean, for sure. he could have Wonder Woman fly in and save the day for all I know is his movie, but he has done military movies before very effectively. And so I trust his process for sure. So he's also done a lot of history movies. I think, uh, uh, well, he's won Academy Awards for- uh, Braveheart. Braveheart way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and, and he did a pretty good one called The Patriot. It was a World War II film that uh, right. was nominated. Uh, yeah, Hacks he's got a wonderful history in that. Hacksaw Ridge was brutal. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and also, uh, perhaps more poppy uh, and maybe even less authentic, although I wouldn't know for sure. The Patriot was a historical movie by Gibson. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. It was 
based on some facts more loosely than I hope my film is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, um, that was, I, I enjoyed that film. Uh, For sure. I'm talking with John Wukovitz, everybody. He's a, uh, he, he was a history teacher at my old high school, and he is about to, I think, really enter some rarefied air. The, the way this usually works, John, is that if, you're, if one of your history books is picked up and optioned by a major uh, production company in Hollywood, that you could become a hot property. They start looking at some of the other books or your future books. And you mentioned Elmore Leonard earlier, Dutch Leonard, everybody, uh, had... Uh, written dozens and dozens of books, detective books mostly, about characters either in Detroit or based in Detroit. And Leonard was really known for his uh, dialogue, I think, and his, Correct. And his plot twists. Um, he became a darling of Hollywood because they just knew that if it was a Dutch Leonard project, that it would, it would sell tickets to the theater and, in this case, uh, sell subscriptions for Netflix. Yeah, for sure. And then that's always the hope. All right, they... they saw interest in one of my books how about some of the others and so yeah. my agent and I have been working on that and so I asked earlier about your most popular book which uh, was your third book up until now uh, what number book was um, maybe you told me uh, what number book was the uh, hell from the heavens hell from the heavens let's see one two three it would be the ninth book so that's interesting. The, the third book is the most popular up until the time the movie gets made about the ninth book. The ninth book vaults into position with the aid of all of that marketing and all that attention. And then who knows what happens after that? Well, yeah. And you asked earlier, well, how does it happen? You know, a book gets picked up for a film. I asked the producer that one day. Uh, you know, I said, okay, there's a, a ton of books on World War II out there. What drew you to this particular story? And she answered very clearly. She said, well, my dad read the book and said, you ought to make a movie out of this. And so she looked at it and agreed. And that's how it came about. So luck, pure luck. Her dad well, read the book, recommended it to her. She looked into it and they decided to pursue it. Luck in terms of the connections, but you are one skilled writer. Thank you. And you, and you stayed at it, you know. Um, you know what they say, the, uh, the fifth book can't happen until the third book happens. And the third book can't happen without the first book. But this also underscores for people listening, those of you that have brands and products and services, um, and you all try to get to that, that key person, the buyer at Walmart, or uh, uh, cracking the, al the Amazon algorithm. And, and John's story, I think, is inspirational because he just wrote a damn good book that an, that a, perhaps a World War II veteran. Is that the story with this, this guy that read it? Um, well, I didn't ask her that. I, that's a good question. I yeah. just, you know, she said dad read it. And, you know, I thought, okay, I owe dad a present. <laughs> anyway, a history fan read the book. His daughter happens to be a Hollywood producer. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's where the, the luck comes in. Well done. How do, you, uh, how do you spend your time, John? How much writing do you do in a day? I, when I'm writing a book, it's generally a full schedule. Uh, six hours of writing easily equals eight hours of anything else I've ever done. Um, you get pretty exhausted. Oh. Uh, because when I, when I work, uh, six hours of work is six full hour, no breaks. Now, I spread them out throughout the day. I, I, you know, I don't sit down and six hours later get up and, you know, my legs would be almost cemented in place kind of a thing. But when I work, it's, it's a definite full work. So I, a 40 hour a week, I compare it to, even though when I write for 30 hours a week, to me, that's equal to 40 hours for sure of teaching. A and lot of writers talk about, sorry, a lot of writers talk about uh, page production. You talk about time production. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Early on, I always wondered, how do I know if I'm working enough? Yeah. You know, because like Elmore Leonard, he, he was a page. He liked to try and do five pages, typewritten pages a day. He was creating most everything as he went along or, you know, he didn't have to research as much. No. Two thirds of my time is research. By, and by the way, he didn't know the endings to the books when he started. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, I read that he, he said, 
I don't know what my characters are going to do until they let me know. And I found that fascinating. But as a historian, you know, I know what they're going to do. <laughs> you know the ending. Yeah, I know the ending. I know all that. So it's a whole different aspect of writing. And I always wondered, well, am I working hard enough or, or whatever? And so I devised a, a minute plan, you know, how many minutes or hours a week kind of a thing. If, if I want to get a book done in two years, that's what I generally take to do a book. I know that, okay, at the first part, maybe I have to put in X amount of hours a week and just keep going like that and I'll get it done. And so that's a, work for me. Do you have a, a uh, does the hour, the, the hours have a page equivalent? What, what does six hours equate to in terms of page production? Can you talk about that? Another good question. No, it, it'll vary because there's sometimes I'll sit at my computer and the words come out like cement blocks. I mean, you just, you write one sentence and you don't like it. And it, you know, what word do I want instead of big, you know, and you can't even think of a synonym for big kind of a thing. Right. All the times I sit down, it's just going, yeah, man, this is like Mario Andretti. I'm dating myself there, I suppose. Mario Andretti at Indianapolis 500. I'm just cruising along here. Probably uh, I, a thousand words a day. If I had to put a a frame on that's four typewritten pages about a thousand words a day is is really good yeah uh, i've done upwards of 2500 to 3000 but after that when i get near that my mind is going okay we're stopping <laughs> you know that's it we're mush you know, you know, you know if you use bigger words you'd you'd, you'd <clears throat> have pa more pages faster yeah yeah you're right <laughs> <laughs> Because it seemed to have worked so far anyway, and uh, I always hand them in by deadline. And, um, you know, I've learned through the years, <clears throat> the first couple books, deadline really, the emphasis was on, <clears throat> excuse me, on dead to me. You know, if I don't get this done, I'm dead. You know, I, I was frantic. Am I doing it right? Well, yeah. now I know, yeah, you, you know what you're doing, and you just sort of move along and get it in on time. I have a, a style slash grammar question for you We're talking about synonyms for big and word word choice uh, of course you have a personal style you write to a certain um, I hear I hear some writers write to a certain education level 11th grade seventh grade college graduate um, you said earlier you were dating yourself by mentioning Mario Andretti to not date yourself you might have mentioned Marco Andretti yeah. who is a couple generations. Do you think about that when you write history books? Are you writing history books for old people? Are you writing history books for young people? Or are you writing history books for all people? For my students. Well, I'm not writing for my students. I want them to be able to understand it. Because some historians get so intricately wrapped up in detail that it's almost like you get trapped in a web and you can't get out. So I always try to be clear. I want people to come away from my books thinking, you know, it was easy to read. It, you know, I, I understood what he's talking about, even though it's a complex subject. And that really helped me, in, you know, because I, when you teach, you have to convey complex material in a simple manner, or else you'll lose the kids. Yes. On. I do the same thing with my writing. I have a, a, a notebook of reminders to myself that each time I start writing another book, I read through. And one of the first one is the letters K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. You know, don't get too complex. And so that would be my market, the, the junior high, high school market. If they can understand it, they might not be interested in my book, but as long as I think they could understand it, then I was fine. Uh, I was happy with that. Yeah. I'm so happy for you, man. I think your world is about to open up big time and you're going to enter this rarefied air. You're, I don't know if you need a testimonial, but I am, I am dubbing you the new Elmore Leonard. <laughs> well, it, you, can, it, you can put that on the back of the book jacket. Uh, in a, a flattering <laughs> way in the same sentence is something else. Uh, apart from that, we're, we're two different kinds of writers and that guy was certainly a pro. Yeah. yeah. Even. I uh, I met him a couple times. You know, he he lived not too far from me here in Royal Oak, and he would be out on uh, having dinner at restaurants and stuff. He was a chain smoker, 
So uh, he was easy to spot because so few people were smoking in those days. Yeah. It was almost like he had left this little trail wherever he went. Um, so uh, John, I am just delighted for you. Uh, once again, everybody, if you're interested in history, uh, in particular the Pacific Theater, if you are a budding author yourself and you want to track this John Wukovitz guy, he understands what's happening. He's got a niche that just won't quit. And now he's about to go Hollywood. I am just so proud of you, sir. Thank you so much for being with me today. I, it was certainly my pleasure. You did a wonderful job. Some questions I'd never heard before, to be honest with you. Thank you, sir. That's hard to do. JohnWukovitz.com, everybody. J-O-H-N-W-U-K-O-V-I-T-S. And uh, the new movie, uh, Mel Gibson movie, starring Mark Wahlberg, is called Hell from the Heavens. And of course, he's got a well, complete line. The movie title, they haven't decided. Oh, good point. That's right. They may change the title. Well, yeah, the, the script has the word destroyer as the title. Working title. It won't use because Nicole Kidman just had a movie six months ago come out called Destroyer. Oh. Uh, but they, it, it's like you need a, something in there as a title to work with. Uh, they'll change it to something, I would assume. We'll be sure to give people an update. Uh, not that... Usually when a Mel Gibson, Mark Wahlberg movie comes out, everybody knows. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not going to need my little help with promoting it. You are the best. Thank you so much for all you do, and best of luck with everything. Well, same to you. It was so much fun today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mike.